since mid-September, the war has changed for Russia. They have a different approach, and also the framing of the war is different. And some of the ways that things have changed are obvious, but others are maybe not so obvious if you aren't following the Russian news on a daily basis. In previous videos, I have talked about how Putin is trying to balance between sort of a group of ultra-nationalists, like the military blockers who want a bigger war in Ukraine, and the population that is to a large extent, disengaged from politics. So in this video, I look at this topic again. I look at Russia's narrative about the war, and I think the conclusion is somewhat surprising because that same balancing act is actually still going on, even after the annexation and the mobilization. So on the one hand, Putin is trying to send messages to the right-wing nationalists, that, that Russia is now 100% committed to the war and that it's a new phase where there will be no mercy on the Ukrainians. But on the other hand, he's also signaling to the population that everything is fine and that they don't need to worry because it's no big deal. Before I get to looking at how things have changed, it's probably a good thing to uh, recap how things were in the beginning of September. Back then, things were pretty much stalled on the front lines. Russia was not making progress on the ground, but the overall story was still the same, that uh, Russia was on the way to victory. I made a video about this assumption that Russian victory uh, was inevitable, and I think that was the mainstream view in Russia at the time. And when you followed the Russian media, you would also get the impression that things were going well for Russia. Uh, it was also still described as a pretty small military operation that didn't affect the lives of ordinary Russians. People could just go on living their lives as they normally would. And then the official message would also be that Russia was only using a small portion of their military force for the operation, and that they had a big reserve of forces that they could just use if they wanted to. So uh, when Putin was asked about why Russia wasn't having more success on the battlefield, he would dismiss the problem and say that it was a deliberate choice because Russia had plenty of time and they were basically fighting with one hand behind their back. So they could escalate anytime they wanted to, uh, and then they would just win quickly. Uh, that was how the war was explained in Russia until the beginning of September. Then Ukraine had some very significant victories in their counteroffensive, especially in the Kharkiv region, but also later uh, around Kherson. And the official Russian narrative about the war became untenable. Like People would be looking at these very significant losses, and it would be obvious that something is wrong. As, uh, specifically, they would be looking at what happened around cities like Izum, and then they would be asking, why the heck are we fighting with only one hand if our forces are suffering like that? Uh, I also made a video about that. And of course, these questions were impossible to answer for Putin because there was just no excuse for not doing everything you can to help the soldiers and to avoid losing the war. So that is why things started changing. And to some extent, the change can be understood in the sense that the message has become exactly the opposite. It has gone from, uh, this is not a real war, it's not a big deal, and we're not even trying to uh, it's total war, the gloves are off, and we are committed 100%. So this is the signal that Putin is trying to convey, especially to the uh, ultra-nationalists, both in his actions and in his messaging. And it is also, uh, to at least some extent, the policy that he's trying to justify with his framing of the war. Uh, some of the ways that this is happening are pretty obvious. Like Russia has passed legislation that claims that four regions of Ukraine are now Russian territory. Uh, they are also conducting something that Putin calls partial mobilization. Uh, it's probably rather uh, a full mobilization. At least they seem to be mobil mobilizing Russian men so quickly that they are on the limits of their capacity for mobilization. Um, there have also been some more threats about nuclear weapons. So these are some of the very obvious manifestations of that, the changed approach to the war. And this makes it clear that uh, it is definitely no longer business as usual for most Russians, because now everyone, in one way or another, uh, has to get personally involved in the war. But there are other things as well that basically serve to underline this message, that we now have a different kind of war, that Russia has a new approach. 
Uh, the first thing I will mention is the designation of a new dedicated commander of the military operation in Ukraine. Uh, this is uh, Sergei Surovikin, who is a controversial figure with a reputation uh, uh, as a kind of tough guy. Um, I think when we look at his previous leadership achievements, then perhaps his reputation as an effective leader is, let's say, overrated. He has recently been in command of the Russian Air Force, and before that, he was in charge of setting up a military police force in Russia to ensure uh, better discipline among the soldiers. Um, and I think if there are two things that the Russian forces in Ukraine have been lacking, then it is probably air power and discipline. But anyways, he has a reputation as a tough guy, and it fits the narrative that Russia has a new and much more ruthless approach to the war. Um, and also the renewed attacks on uh, Ukrainian cities and civilian infra infrastructure uh, can be understood in this light. I think ostensibly the purpose is to undermine the determination of the Ukrainian people by making them suffer more. And it is probably also a purpose to destroy some critical infrastructure going into the winter so the Ukrainians will have to live without power and heating uh, when it gets cold. But I think when we look closer at these attacks, then it gets harder to understand the practical logic. Like first, there is no real reason to believing that uh, these kinds of uh, terror bombardments actually work. Like it has been tried many times in history and it almost never works. Um, often it has the opposite effect, that the population gets even more filled with hatred and determination to beat the aggressor. And uh, we have to remember that Ukraine is a big country. Like, even if Russia has thousands of these drones, then it's not going to be enough to create devastation everywhere. So uh, it's going to create suffering in some Ukrainian families, but it is not going to stymie the entire civil society. Um, and then the next question is why Russia would use these weapons on civilians and not on the Ukrainian military? Like, from a military point of view, it... I think it just doesn't make sense. Like Russia is really suffering on the battlefield and you would think that they would want to use these drones to improve the situation there. Um, I'm sure they have all kinds of ISR related problems on the battlefield, so they perhaps don't have the best picture of uh, where to hit the Ukrainians. But still, I think most military forces would try to use these weapons on the front lines. And these two things together, the fact that hitting civilians um, probably won't work, and the fact that Russia is choosing to do it anyways instead of hitting military targets um, indicates that the real explanation has to do with something else. And what I'm saying is essentially that the missile and drone strikes on Ukrainian cities are, to a large extent, about sending messages to a domestic audience in Russia. So it's, it's basically a kind of, yeah, a morbid kind of PR campaign, but it sends the message that, that Russia is serious about the war and that something is being done. And this could not have been achieved if Russia had used the drones on military targets because the Russian news is already full of stories about how they are destroying Ukrainian military equipment. So they, they are attacking Ukrainian cities because that gives them something new to put on TV. And, and this gives the Russian population the understanding that things may be bad right now, but on the other side, on the Ukrainian side, it's worse. Then we've also seen a significant change in the way that Russian officials talk about the Ukrainians, also Putin. Uh, they actually don't talk so much about Nazis anymore. Instead, the Ukrainians are now described as nationalists and terrorists. And uh, when something happens, like the attack on the Kerch Strait Bridge, it is framed in the light of international terrorism. This is a noteworthy new way of explaining the enemy. Um, and I think if you think about it, then Nazis are terrible people that attack and conquer other countries. But terrorists are conniving traitors, we can say, that operate within society. So they have safe havens abroad, where they plan and prepare their evil misdeeds, and then they strike without warning in the societies that they are against. Like, okay, I, I, I may be reading too much into this, um, 
and uh, the Nazi trope may come back. But I think there is a fundamental problem with the Nazi narrative when you want to explain the war to common Russians. And that is that Ukraine has not actually invaded Russia. Uh, even if Nazism is, a, is this kind of imperialistic state ideology, is it then really that dangerous for Russia? Like, are common Russians afraid that Ukraine is going to take over their country? So I, I think this framing of the Ukrainians as terrorists is much better for Putin, because that is actually a threat that common Russians can relate to. And uh, it can be a meaningful explanation of why they have to go to war. I also want to mention the very vocal criticism that there has been in the Russian media about the mobilization process. Uh, that there have been mistakes and people have been mobilized that shouldn't have been and so forth. I think many people in the West get this totally wrong. Like they see it as something new that there is criticism of the government in Russia. I think we need to understand that this is actually a classical example of how Russian propaganda works. Like there is a recognition that there is dissatisfaction in society about something. So uh, what you do is you embrace that dissatisfaction and then you divert it onto something else that is less dangerous. So this criticism becomes a kind of lightning rod. Uh, what this does is that it makes the individual feel like they are alone with their anger about something because everybody else seems to be concerned about something else. So you might feel that uh, the whole idea of mobilization in general is repulsive, but everybody else looks like they're just upset about sort of the practical implementation of the mobilization. So, so the criticism uh, of the mistakes in the process of mobilization actually makes it harder to organize an anti-war movement. And lately, we have also heard some messages from Putin and uh, Moscow Mayor Sergei Sabyanin that the, the partial mobilization is almost over. So really, there is no need to complain about it, right? Because uh, it's a thing of the past and everyone can just go back to their normal life really soon. Uh, finally, an aspect that I want to mention is that the Russian media has doubled down on stories about how bad the crisis is in Europe because of the sanctions against Russia and how there are protests and demonstrations everywhere in Europe. The message is that Europe is uh, falling apart, basically, and that the Europeans are fed up with, a, with the politicians who are so stupid that they have created a pointless recession. So again, this shows the Russians that things are worse on the other side. So if we put all these things together, uh, then it is still, I think, overall, a pretty optimistic message from Putin to the Russians. Um, there were some setbacks in the beginning of September, but Putin has basically managed to put the blame on that on the Ministry of Defense. Um, now the course has been corrected and Russia has fully engaged in the war. So the gloves are off and the time is over when they were being nice to the Ukrainians. Um, and, and the war is justified because it is a fight against international terrorism that is a threat to the Russian society, and therefore it is necessary that everyone contributes. Um, there have been some mistakes in the process of mobilization that is recognized, but uh, what else could you really expect when you have to do something so big in such a short period of time? So the message is that people in general uh, support the mobilization and support the, the government's policies. And, and the good news to, to the, the Russian population is that uh, things will get better soon because both the Ukrainian society and their supporters in the West are suffering more than the Russians are. So the enemy will lose determination very soon and then, the, then Russia will win. So this is the message about the war that you get from the Russian media and from official sources. I think they've actually managed to make this transition to mobilization pretty well. Like it has not led to widespread protests. But of course, they're just kicking the can down the road. Putin is still trying to do the same balancing act that I have talked about in previous videos between the ultranationalists and the, the population.
Uh, so they're trying to satisfy the right wing sort of military bloggers and the ultra nationalists by doing things that signal a dramatic escalation and a new and tougher approach in the war. But then on the other hand, they're also trying to comfort the population by sending messages, basically optimistic messages about how things are not that bad and yeah, it's only a partial mobilization and it's going to end soon and the war is not going to take that long. So what I'm saying is that the current Russian narrative is still untenable because Putin is not trying to build that public support for a big war that would be necessary for actually winning in Ukraine. So the message you will get from watching Putin is still one of normality. He goes on TV and he does all kinds of other things that are not related to the war. So it looks like the war has not pushed aside all the other government business, but that it's just one thing out of many on Putin's mind. So for ordinary Russians, life is supposedly still normal. Uh, it is just a different kind of normality where there was this thing called partial mobilization that took place, but uh, it's not that big of a deal. And of course, this is not going to work. Uh, you can't keep pretending that you're winning a war forever. Like war is the ultimate reality check and eventually they will have to address the facts. And then it will be interesting to see how these two groups will react. Like how will the ultra nationalists re react when they find out that Russia is not actually winning and that the government is not fully committed? And how will the population react when the war does not end and the mobilized soldiers aren't coming home and there is going to be a new wave of partial mobilization. So, so the tensions still exist, and it will get more and more difficult for Putin to make the ends meet. Okay, I'm going to end it here. If you found the video interesting, please give it a like. Uh, it's a big help. And also remember that you can subscribe to the channel and click on the bell icon to get notifications when I upload a new video. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you again next time.